Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunga Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off the Ball Network. And today we're going to be discussing, you know, this year's trade deadline. We're going to be discussing the biggest winners and losers of this year's 2022 NBA trade deadline. But before we get started with today's episode, if you are new to our YouTube channel or listening to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, do me a quick favor by like, comment, and subscribing, turning on post notifications, giving us a five star rating and a nice hey, review. Okay. I would greatly be appreciative of that. Now, Let's talk about the biggest winners and losers of this year's trade deadline. You know, I want to start off with the losers, Colin, because obviously the Sacramento Kings, they they definitely are the biggest losers of this year's trade deadline, if you ask me. Trading away Tyrese Halliburton, this is a guy that could have potentially been your franchise player. It widens the window of you guys being able to, you know, win games in the near future. Trading him away for a guy that, you know, doesn't really raise the ceiling of this team overall and isn't really going to be the best fit alongside De'Aaron Fox as opposed to Tyrese Halliburton. It just didn't make a lot of sense for the Kings to make this move. De'Aaron Fox has already voiced his displeasures of not being uh, all that happy with the fact that, you know, he's losing games in Sacramento. And if you're going to trade anybody, you probably would like to start with that asset if you're the Sacramento Kings. But obviously, this is one of the worst franchises in probably sports history, given the decisions that they've made in the last 15 to 20 years. This is a team that, you know, just has not made any adequate moves. They always constantly do a great job in terms of, you know, for the most part, drafting, I would say. But that's only because, you know, they're a lottery team every single season. And given the fact that, you know, you bring in Demonte Sabonis, who essentially is a win now type of move, and you're not going to be able to really change the overall dynamic of this team from that column. This move made absolutely no sense. You just gave up the guy that was really optimistic about this team overall. And not to mention, you know, he's a lot younger on a way better contract. And he's not, and you don't have to worry about him walking out for the next couple of seasons like you do with De'Aaron Fox. So if this experiment doesn't work well and doesn't go too um, positively for the Sacramento Kings, you have to be a little bit worried about the fact that, you know, De'Aaron Fox might end up going to a team like maybe the New York Knicks or maybe even worse, forcing, forcing his way out with a trade. But... The Trailblazers are the next team in the losers column, and here's why. I think the best asset that they got back in return this trade deadline was Joe Ingles, and he's injured for the entire season. And he's more than likely not gonna be a piece that they keep, I could imagine. Um, but essentially, you know, you gave up Robert Covington and Norman Powell, two of your better wing um, options on the perimeter from a defensive perspective and offensive. These are two guys that, you know, you also traded for and gave up first round picks for while letting younger assets walk out of the door. And in less than a season or two, both of these guys are out of the window. This makes no sense if you're the Portland Trailblazers. Damian Lillard is clearly out of the door here in the near future. But if you're Portland, you would have thought you would have also been able to get a lot more than Josh Hart and maybe a pick or two for Robert Covington and Norman Powell. But essentially, you know, the Portland Trailblazers, they just do not do a great job in terms of decision making, making moves at the right time. And this is a franchise that, you know, has essentially for the better half of the last decade traded in all of their great defenders for offensive players that just haven't been able to really make things go for this team from a winning perspective. So the Portland Trailblazers are definitely one of the biggest losers in this year's trade deadline. But the next team we have to talk about is the Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers obviously brought in Russell Westbrook this offseason. A guy who was under a max contract who's been flipped a few times while he's under that contract and this team is currently ninth in the west four to five games below 500 lebron james and anthony davis looked a little bit disgruntled with the entire situation that they've been dealing with this entire year and this is a roster that is full with nothing but minimum contracts they were not able to make any moves this trade deadline and for a team that it needs extreme improvement in essentially all facets the fact that they weren't able to really make anything happen due to the contracts and you know them not having all that many uh, appreciating assets and guys with much value the los angeles lakers are definitely some of the biggest losers in this year's trade deadline as well but on to the next we got to talk about the washington wizards the washington wizards just traded away spencer dinwiddie montrez harrell and separate deals and davis bertans now obviously the Montrezl Harrell trading package, it just did not look like it was anything even worth looking at. 
trading away for a guy like Ish Smith and I forget what the other asset was as well. It doesn't even really matter. The Washington Wizards are in no man's land as of right now. This is a team that just continues to take a step back and a step back and another step back. Bradley Bill or is getting ready to undergo a season ending injury. So you're not going to see him for the remainder of the year. Now, they obviously, they just acquired Kristaps Porzingis in a deal from the Dallas Mavericks. But here's the catch. Kristaps Porzingis has only played 134 games in the last three seasons. This is a guy that's only going to give you about 45 games every single year. If you're the Washington Wizards, you're going to have to prepare for that. Obviously, Spencer Dinwiddie was a guy that they were going to have to get rid of. You know, he kind of tore down the locker room for whatever reason. Um, I guess people didn't like the leadership qualities that he brought to the table or the lack of production, I would say, that he brought to the table. And the fact that he's one of the most inefficient guards in the entire NBA. But since halfway mark of the first half of the season, the Washington Wizards have fallen off of a cliff. And they've been derailed by injuries and COVID and, you know, safety and health protocol listings and things of that nature, obviously. Bradley Bill's definitely taking a step back from an um, offensive perspective for whatever reason. Maybe it's the new ball. But the Washington Wizards are not a team that too many teams in the Eastern Conference are fearing, if any team is fearing them. And they've been on for record saying that, you know, they've been trying to bring in assets that are going to help um, elevate this team alongside Bradley Bill. But unfortunately, you know, bringing in Kristaps Porzingis, I got to tell you, that's not the move that is really going to be all that conducive to winning. But that's a story for another day. But the, the Atlanta Hawks, that is another team that we have to talk about as being losers in this year's trade deadline. Atlanta is an extremely weird team. This is a team that struggled for the better half of the last two to three seasons. Fortunately, last year, by the second half of the year, they kind of were able to get things turned around, got a new voice in the locker room, bringing in Nate McMillan, a well-respected coach in the entire NBA. And they were able to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, where they ultimately ended up falling to the Milwaukee Bucks in six games, I believe. Trey Young put on the display that, you know, he's a top five point guard in the entire league. And you would think that coming into this season, they were going to be able to build on that. But obviously, they have not been able to fish the issues that have been within that entire locker room and you know guys like cam reddish obviously were traded for essentially nothing you got back kevin knox in the trade for cam reddish and unfortunately you know cam reddish he was a guy that was under a rookie contract so you weren't going to really be able to get too much in return for him but kevin knox got to be the last guy on my list if i'm the atlanta hawks in terms of uh returning assets that i'm trying to obtain for cam reddish and not to mention, John Collins, he, he has always been on record for, you know, just voicing his displeasures with the entire organization for whatever reason. Maybe you could have got more value in terms, you know, flipping him due to the fact that, you know, his contract, giving him $125 million, maybe that's not even a, a great contract for John Collins, if we're being completely honest. And the fact that he's your second best player alongside Trey Young, and he ha doesn't have the ability to create for himself, even though he's made some strides within that aspect of his game offensively, he's not a guy that is going to be the deciding factor in whether or not this team, you know, reaches the promised land. And I think at some point, honestly, I do believe that the Atlanta Hawks are going to have to part ways with John Collins because I don't see that relationship getting um, fixed with him and that entire franchise and the organization for whatever reason. And maybe you could have even dealt away with guys like Kevin Herter or Bogdanovich who were not all that um, consistent offensively for you. Or even Danilo Gallinari, a guy who's obviously getting up there within age. But essentially, the Atlanta Hawks are definitely um, some, among some of the biggest losers in this year's trade deadline. And it's for those reasons. But let's get on to the winners. Let's talk about some positivity, right? The Brooklyn Nets just acquired Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, two first round picks, and Ben Simmons, an all NBA level defender. This is an A plus trade if you're the Brooklyn Nets. The only thing that sucks about this trade is obviously giving up James Harden. But this is a team that essentially just fixed all of their issues aside from Kyrie Irving being a part time participant. In this one transaction, you get an all -N NBA level defender, a guy who's more than likely going to be the anchor of your defensive back line. He's going to improve, you know, the deflections that you guys accumulate on the defensive end in a half court setting, not the most decorated score, but, you know, you can do, run some actions with him in the short roll with Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Seth Curry is one of the better pick and roll ball handlers in the entire, you know, NBA, and he's extremely underrated from that aspect. Not to mention, this is a guy that also can be a 40 percent plus three point shooter for you outside, improves your spacing even tremendously with Joe Harris being out as of right now. And then not to mention, you get Andre Drummond, a guy who's arguably been the best backup center in the entire NBA for this season. 
This is an A-plus trade if you're the Brooklyn Nets. I'm not even going to spend too much time on it. If you're the Los Angeles Clippers, I would give them a B-plus. They did a great job in terms of, you know, acquiring some wing depth, bringing in Robert Covington, a defensive um, wing who has great intangibles on that aspect of the floor. And although he's regressed as an on-ball defender, he is still somebody that does a great job in terms of being a team defender. And, you know, he's a plus defender from that aspect, right? And then not to mention Norman Powell, put the ball in the basket for you, can give you 16 to 20 points on any given night of great efficiency. Has the ability to space the floor out for you. Can put him in catch and shoot scenarios, spot ups, all that good stuff. And he's not all that ball dominant. He is also an asset that is going to help keep you guys heads above water and potentially might add to the um, fact that, you know, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George could potentially come back here this season. So if you're the Los Angeles Clippers and you're Steve Ballmer, you got to be very optimistic about the near future here in Los Angeles, especially with the Lakers being such a uh, look down upon organization for the time being. But the New Orleans Pelicans, I also believe, deserve to be in the win column of this year's NBA trade deadline. But the Pelicans, they were a team that accounted went back and forth with as far as, you know, whether or they should be winners or losers. But I, for the time being, I think they are winners as of right now because you were able to acquire CJ McCollum and all-star caliber guard without having to give up, you know, any of your tremendous assets and a guy like Brandon Ingram, obviously. Um, Obviously, you sent away Nikhil Alexander-Walker. He was a pretty adequate, you know, piece for them, I guess. But he wasn't going to be the deciding factor on whether or not this team could make the postseason or not. So you elevate, you know, the, your level of play at the guard position, not to mention add an additional ball handler right next to Brandon Ingram, a guy that probably can, you know, create some opportunities from Ingram from an offensive perspective, not to mention, you know, increases the spacing for Zion Williamson and Jonas Valanciunas, two guys that are going to be extremely dominant in terms, of, you know, just the inside scoring. And with Giannis Valanciunas, he's a guy that can you can place in pick and pop scenarios, kind of be like a little tandem compared to, you know, um, Zach Levine and Nikola Vucevic from that aspect. They can have some similarities and just in terms of, you know, the actions that they can run with those two guys at the helm of your offense offensively. And this is just a really good trade. The one thing that I am not too optimistic about is the fact that you have to give up a first round pick um, in order to acquire CJ McCollum. And essentially, if this experiment does not work out and you guys don't end up making it to the postseason, you gave up a first round pick that could have been a little bit more better to the timeline of, you know, Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson as far as the future um, with the New Orleans Pelicans. But other than that, I think the Pelicans have a lot of things to be optimism about, optimistic about. But essentially, the 76ers might have been the biggest winners this year in this year's trade deadline. They could have gotten a way less assets in return for Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons is obviously all NBA level defender like I just talked about. Can facilitate the basketball at 6'10", 6'11". Ranked in the top 25 in terms of matchup difficulty. So he's gonna take on your toughest assignment from that perspective. And then not to mention, you know, he's just going to be somebody that can elevate any championship level team. And, you know, with that being said, you were if you were Daryl Moore, you're going to look to get some assets that are going to be equally as competent as it was having Ben Simmons on the roster. And they were able to do that and they acquired James Harden. Now, obviously, Harden's been a little bit inefficient this year. It looks like he's digressed. I think a lot of it has to do with his injury and, you know, just the fact that he was in a very um, non-constructive organization that didn't really look like there was much construction from top to bottom in the most recent months and not to mention you know there was a lot of injuries that were um derailing that team from being able to be in the win column as much and you've seen them fall all the way down in the standings to as low as the seventh and eighth seed so acquiring james harden putting him in a situation that's a lot more conducive to winning sticking him alongside joel and Embiid, the spacing is going to improve for the philadelphia 76ers obviously you're going to miss your three-point shooting with seth curry this is a team that didn't really look all that great from that but essentially you know james harden being a ball dominant player um a guy that can be an isolation threat in you know any scenario with the shot clock winding down take some pressure off of joel and bead so that hopefully um decreases the chances of him being injured again while also being able to keep some of your um proper assets in tyrese maxi matisse Thibel, and tobias harris i think this is an a plus win if you are the philadelphia 76 and the last team I want to talk about has to be the Indiana Pacers acquiring Tyrese Halliburton. It was a great move for the Indiana Pacers. You didn't have to get rid of um, anything that 
you wanted to hold on to necessarily. Demontis Sabonis already, already voices displeasures with the organization. He wasn't somebody that was too optimistic about being here for the long haul. And Tyrese Halliburton, you're going to pair him with a guy like Miles Turner. They're going to run some really fun actions with those two. Rightfully, if Rick Carlisle can, you know, implement an offense that's going to be um, adequate to, you know, both of their games offensively. And Tyrese Halliburton, he's already the type of guard that Rick Carlisle kind of favors already. You know, he's uh, being an additional ball handler alongside Malcolm Brogdon and Chris Dorte. This backcourt is going to look really phenomenal for the foreseeable future. And not to mention, Tyrese Halliburton is a guy that can give you 16-6 on any given night. And who knows what his production can look like, you know, once he reaches his peak. And not to mention, he's on a much lesser contract than DeMontis Sabonis. He's uh, a lot younger, so he widens the overall success rate of, you know, the window for this team here in these next couple of seasons and not to mention he's just a fresher face and a much better look for the indianapolis pacers and he might be able to sell some more tickets given you know the pacers rank in the bottom five from that aspect so indiana is definitely one of the biggest wins but essentially this was one of the best trade deadlines that i've seen in recent years you know there was a lot of transactions that were made and some transactions um left teams in the losers column because they weren't made but essentially you know Appreciate all you guys for tuning into another episode of me on the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to do a quick little favor by giving us a five star rating. Nice review. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe as well. I would greatly appreciate it. Y'all have a good day.